Hi guys, Matt Easton here, Squadra Gladiatoria. Hopefully my voice is getting slightly back to normal now. Um, so this is a brief point about distal taper. So I have spoken a lot, if I just put the longsword down for a second, I've spoken a lot in the past about distal taper. What is distal taper? For those of you who haven't seen my previous videos, it is the taper, in other words, the reducing of thickness in that direction. Okay, so a good replica sword very often, at least if it has a kind of cut and thrust type blade or a fairly broad blade very often will be thicker at the base of the blade here and will gradually get flatter and flatter and flatter and the thing that many people who've maybe not seen many swords or not seen many antique swords don't realize is how thin blades often get in this portion of the blade um, and if actually I look uh, let's just go onto the wall here and take uh, let's take the toolbar okay the toolbar is looking at it approximately seven millimeters, maybe six millimeters thick at the base of the blade, and about two millimeters thick in what we would call the foible. Okay, and it's an interesting factor that although this is an Indian-made uh, saber, might possibly be a European blade, but even um, whether it's an Indian sword or whether it's a European sword, so I've just, I just put that down for a second and pick up the. Uh, Wilkinson here, uh, Coldstream Guards Officer's Sword from the Crimean War, um, it, it's got a very similar distal taper. It starts off, in this case, of probably about seven or eight millimetres, I'd say, um, and goes down to, again, about three millimetres. Okay? So as you can see, the blade gets flatter and flatter and flatter as you go along the blade. Now, the point of this video, I talked extensively about distal taper in the past, and generally speaking, having less and less and less metal as you get towards the end of the blade makes the sword feel better in the hand. It makes it more responsive, it means that a lot of the mass of the blade is down here. Additionally, potentially, it means that with a flatter blade, if you're talking about something like a sabre or a toolbar, um, it also means that it has less resistance cutting through a target because of course it's flatter and thinner there. And I should mention that at that point, the, um, the katana a lot of people talk about katanas as soon as I mention cutting at all. And um, a point of the katana to make is that it's generally quite a thick blade and they very often, the antique ones, don't have very much distal taper. They usually do have some distal taper, but not very, very much. So at the cutting portion of the blade, they're usually quite thick, thicker than most blades from other parts of the world. Um, sabres, tulwars, uh, shamshirs, kilich, other types of sword. Um, so, in actual fact, the uh, katana is quite a thick blade. However, it's worth mentioning that in modern uh, Japanese uh, test cutting competitions, tatami cutting competitions, it's not uncommon for people to use a thinner, uh, in other words, a flatter blade than was usual historically. Because, of course, it gives you an advantage in cutting. You can cut through the tatami mats better, so people use it. However, um, it's not what historical katanas were actually like. They tended to be quite thick, even in the cutting portion blade. Anyway, coming back to my main point of my video. So now, picking up the longsword. Now, a curious feature of longswords of this type of blade that are very broad at the base, and not just longswords, in fact, arming swords as well, any type of sword that's very broad at the base and very pointy up here, you'll see that it is a very different philosophy to the tulwar. The tulwar is basically as wide at the cutting portion of the blade here as it is at the base of the blade. And in actual fact, some tulwars, and this is possibly an example, are even wider at the cutting portion of the blade than they are at the base of the blade. Another example of a sword that is wider at the cutting portion of the blade is the famous British um, 1796 light cavalry saber. That is has a broader blade at the cutting portion blade. Uh, falchions are another example, messes sometimes. Um, machetes, actually, uh, are usually like that. So, generally speaking, if you, have a, if you want a blade to cut really, really well, you make it broader at the end of the blade, where you want it to cut, uh, and flatter. However, very clearly, you'll see this longsword, or indeed any type of Type 15, Type 17, Type 18, um, Type 14, oak shop typology this is, um, medieval sword, does not fit into that equation. In actual fact, the breadth is at the base of the blade, and the cutting portion of the blade, let's just look at that for a second, the cutting portion of the blade is no wider, actually, 
than what looks like a much more narrow sword, the sabre, the cutting portion of the blade on the long sword is no wider than the uh, sabre, than the 19th century sabre. And in actual fact, my experience is that 19th century sabres can cut as well as um, long swords, medieval long swords, despite the fact that they're a lot lighter. Um, so, um, one curious feature in regards to distal taper with these blades is that very often this type of blade that's very broad at the base and pointy tipped, and I could give the Albion Ring as another example, it's essentially a very, very similar blade type, almost the same blade type, just slightly uh, not quite as broad but a bit longer. Um, they very often have almost no distal, distal taper. Um, if we look along the blade here of the of the mercenary, it's it's about seven seven millimeters, maybe eight millimeters thick at the base of the blade. And if we come down to the cutting portion of the blade, it's about five or six millimeters. It's slightly narrower than here, but really not very much at all. In fact, I would say it's probably something like seven millimeters to five millimeters. So it's got very little, it does still have a bit of distal taper, but very, very little. Why is that? Well, very simply, remember that this is about mass, okay? It's about, uh, it's about mass and uh, volume of, of steel. And essentially what you want to have, in a sword that is going to handle well, you want the majority of the mass of your steel in this portion of the blade, um, and it slowly to get lighter and lighter towards the tip. The lighter it gets towards the tip, the quicker it will be and the more responsive it will be. And remember, um, of course, that speed um, is very important in the equation of hitting power. Okay? Mass is important, but velocity is also important. Okay? Basic Newtonian physics. Um, so, firstly, the fact that the blade is very broad and tapers to a point means that you don't need very much distal taper because you're already going from having lots of metal up here to less and less and less and less and less metal until you have zero metal at the point. Okay, so you've already got the essentially the taper is in the silhouette in the shape of the blade this way. You don't need therefore that much taper in the blade that way. The second point is that by not having so much distal taper, we create an incredibly stiff blade. Okay, that is one stiff blade. If I grab either of those swords, I won't do it now, but if I grab either of those swords, you'll see I can flex them really, really easily. Why is it such a stiff blade? Well, very simply, because it's pointy, and it's going to be used against armour of the time, whether it's someone in light armour, like Gamberson, or even thick uh, winter clothing. Medieval clothing is, is, you know, many layers, and it's woven well. It's not easy to penetrate. Or, indeed, if it's male, the, the male gussets inside, um, or voiders betwe between the, the plates, plate armour, um, uh, or indeed something like a brigandine um, or uh, coat of plates, trying to get between the plates of a coat of plates, this type of thing. So essentially if this is going to be used in half sorting, or just conventional grip and just thrusting, you want this blade to be as stiff as possible, and actually having this broad blade at the base that tapers down to a point and remains fairly thick in that direction, in distally, it remains fairly thick, gives you a very stiff blade. However, what you sacrifice, as I've made, mentioned in previous videos, whenever you gain something, you generally lose something else. Okay, there's no ultimate sword, um, just some swords are better in certain specific situations than other swords. And where this type of sword excels is penetrating stuff with the point. Okay. It's also because it's very stiff, it, uh, it's very good in the bind, it's good at opposing, um, if someone swings something like a pole axe at you, you do actually stand a chance of being to, able to oppose it, whether you do it with half sword or conventional grip. It's, it's a very stiff bar, so it's good defensively and it's very good for thrusting. But what you sacrifice is cutting um, power, cutting efficiency, shall we say. And Medieval arming swords and long swords are not great cutters um, for their weight, and they tend to be fairly heavy as well. If we take an average um, medieval arming sword, we're looking at uh, a weight anywhere up to about three and a half pounds. There's a famous example in the Wallace collection in London, uh, A460, I think it is, which weighs three and a half pounds. That's actually the same weight as, or in fact, slightly heavier, I think, than this long sword. Um, so some medieval arming swords are relatively heavy. You compare that to 
the Victorian Sabre. Victorian Sabre is two pounds. The Tilwar is two pounds. So when you're talking about three and a half pounds, it's a fairly weighty weapon. But of course, it fits within the context of the time. If you're using a sword in an age where people, everybody has thick clothing or armour of various levels, and you're using it potentially against people who are attacking you with pole axes or halberds or things like this, uh, and shields are in play as well, then a heavier sword makes sense. Um, in an environment where people don't wear such heavy clothing, like in India, then clearly a lighter sword that's uh, better at cutting and quicker makes more sense. It's all about context. Uh, my favourite word, as you know. So there we go, guys. Really, a few points bundled in there. That, but the main point I want to make is that distal taper is always described as a good thing. Like, oh, um, you know, if you're talking about a modern replica sword, replica sword, people always go, has it? What you know? What's its distal taper like? Well, that's a fair point. And what that comes from is that a lot of cheap or lower end replica swords uh, don't have enough distal taper, and that's why they handle like crowbars a lot of the time. However. If a blade is very broad at the base and tapering down to a point like this, sometimes you don't need distal taper, and by not having distal taper, you gain stiffness and thrusting power. Um, and generally speaking, that takes away from the cutting potential, but it adds to the sword in other ways. Uh, and it's perfectly historical, in fact, to have a sword which has no distal taper, if it is this type of shape of blade. There we go, guys. Cheers.